Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! As we've been hearing and saying, after a week when the Commons has demanded more from Theresa May over her Brexit plans, a cross-party group of MPs is trying to force a vote on the government's Brexit deal when it comes. At the centre of all of this is a familiar face, the former Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg, who's with me now. Uh, welcome, Mr Clegg. Morning. Um, can we start by uh, establishing exactly what you are trying to achieve? What we want to achieve is actually what a previous Conservative government did prior to some major European talks, when John Major uh, had to go to the rest of Europe and negotiate the Maastricht Treaty, he first put in effect something very similar to a white paper to the, United, to the uh, House of Commons and said, these are my objectives, this is the way I want to try and approach these talks, will you give me your backing or not? And incidentally, it's also exactly the same approach that Theresa May took under the coalition government when she negotiated a new deal on police and judicial cooperation in the no. European Union. So the precedent is there, and it's a very good precedent because it gives the government of the day much greater authority if it's negotiating with other governments mm. with the backing of its parliament. Of course, in those cases, there hadn't been a referendum of the whole country first. Mm. Um, can it be clear, however, if she comes to the House of Commons and says, this is the kind of Brexit deal that I want, and that's voted down, that means the House of Commons would vote down the way she wants to negotiate, make her position almost impossible, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, she'd have to go back and sort of improve her negotiating stance. Personally, I think Theresa May has absolutely nothing to fear. Everybody, including people like myself who campaigned for us to remain in the European Union, of course accept the mandate from the British people to pull us out of the European Union. But what the government doesn't have, because of course the Brexiteers never, never sort of, they withheld from the British people what they meant by Brexit, is that whilst the government has a mandate to pull us out of the European Union, they don't have a mandate how to do that. And that is why it is important that the government strengthens its own hand and also just subjects its own ideas to the, to, to the sort of scrutiny of but Parliament before they go to the negotiations elsewhere in Europe. And again, sorry, to be clear, if this vote happens and the government loses, then they can't trigger Article 50. So this could delay the triggering of Article 50. Yes, and by the way, that would be a very good thing anyway, because I think Theresa May has made already a fundamental tactical error by saying, frankly, just to, to sort of uh, throw red meat to her back benches, that she's going to trigger Article 50 in March of next year, because she's already, in doing so, lost about a quarter of her negotiating timetable. Because as anybody in Europe, and I speak to many politicians uh, across Europe, will tell you, nothing is going to meaningfully happen until the end of next year after the German election. So, so this she's is an already attempt actually... to delay the triggering no, of not, Article it, 50? Not at all. It, not at all. It is an attempt to ensure that as the government Sounds pursues right. its mandate of pulling us out of the European Union, they do so in a workable way, a legal way, and crucially, in a way which doesn't throw the, the, the single market All baby right. out with the EU bathwater. Absolutely crucial question. Do you have the numbers? I, I, I strongly suspect that if the government comes with a sensible, coherent plan for Brexit, they will win a majority across, uh, across the, the sides in the House of Commons. This is not a... This is not a so you, sort of... you don't have a majority of, as it were, conservative Europhiles with the opposition, which could defeat the government on a substantive issue on the floor of the House I of Commons? I haven't been... You know, I, the, 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 I'm, I'm not a sort of whip. I haven't been sitting there in a whip's office totting up numbers. What I am keen to do, along with many MPs from all other parties, including a number of conservatives, is to say, look, we live in a representative democracy where, yes, of course, the government has the mandate to pull us out of the European Union. It doesn't have the mandate to do that without any scrutiny well, or accountability from part. By the way, let me to, ask, to, 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 let to me do ask otherwise is, is as absurd as suggesting that when a, when a party wins an election, uh, after that it should be able to do exactly what it, what it likes and Parliament should have well, no role whatsoever. We don't do that in our parliamentary democracy. I, I put it to you that it is pretty clear what we were voting for at the time of the referendum. Um, I was talking to Michael Gove, I can play the clip, but I said to him, um, does this mean coming out of the single market? And he said, yes, it absolutely does. Um, it was absolutely clear that the, re retaining con or taking back control over immigration meant things that made our membership of the single market well, incompatible. And that therefore, this sort of fantasy of a soft Brexit is simply a fantasy. No. I put it to you that you are actually trying to subvert the will of the British people in this referendum. They, they knew what they were voting for, and they were very clear. 
Well, they weren't, of course, clear. Boris Johnson said we could st stay in the single market. Apparently now people like Michael Ho Gove and Daniel Hannan ludicrously claim that immigration had nothing to do with it, having, by the way, scared the living daylights out of everybody by claiming falsely that 8 million Turks would flood into the United Kingdom. Look, let's be clear. What is coming back to haunt the Brexiteers, which is why they're, I mean, people like me are called Bramoners. I think they are in a state of Brunile. They are Bruniers because they are denying... The, 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 the mendacity of their original campaign. They deliberately withheld both, from the British people both sides any were plan. Saying, saying terrible no, porkies all the way through. No, I don't actually think the, the, the Remain campaign, made, in my view, was a listless campaign. It made some exaggerations. It didn't claim that we were going to get 350 million quid in the NHS every week. It didn't claim that there was a utopia awaiting us if we leave the European Union. It didn't claim that 8 million Turks would come here. But the point is this if they had spelled out, if they had spelled out with one voice, in other words, if Farage, okay. Gove, Johnson, and all this cast of opportunists and chancers had actually agreed on what Brexit was, then they would have a mandate to implement that, that plan. But they very deliberately withheld that from the British people. Why? Okay. Because they didn't have a plan if... they could agree on. And what's worrying is they don't still appear to have a plan which they can agree on about what Brexit actually means in practice. It sounds to me as if you want Brexit to mean a so-called soft Brexit, trying yes. to stay inside the single market, which is not compatible with the promises given during the referendum campaign. Of course campaign, it is. Of course it and is. That therefore, you are trying to subvert what happened in, in, in the referendum because you cannot control, take back control over immigration and end the free movement of people and stay inside the single market. That much is surely clear. Donald Tusk, Michael Gove may not agree on much, but they agree on that. Mm. Well, I think they are both actually wrong. There are countries outside the European Union, such as Norway, which do have greater, have pa have greater powers of control over who comes in and out of their country, and yet they have full participation in the single market. My own view has always been that if this government was smart, tough but also smart, with a bit of diplomatic sort of fancy footwork, it could actually square the circle on changing the, 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 the sort of rules of freedom of movement but retaining full membership of the single market. What it cannot do, which is what the Conservatives appear to be saying, and it's their contradiction, not that of the British people, that is skewering them now, that you cannot say, I want untrammeled, unfettered access to a single market of rules, but I don't want to abide by any of those rules. That is impossible, but that, is not the, that wasn't a problem created by the 17.4 million people who voted for Brexit. Well, what That's a problem created by the contradictions within the Conservative Party. So what do you say to all those Leave voters who look at you and say, here is a classic example of an establishment liberal trying to go behind the set, as it were, and fix the referendum result afterwards. This is exactly the kind of betrayal that we were frightened of. No, I, if, I was, if I was a Leave voter, which I wasn't, if I was a Brexit voter, I would feel increasingly betrayed that I voted in the belief that all these Brexiteers knew what they were doing. I put my faith in them. I put my faith in Gove and Johnson and Farage. And I would be increasingly angry, particularly as my electricity and gas prices go up, as I realise I can't take my kids on that holiday to Spain because it's now 20% more expensive. I'd be increasingly angry that these people, months after the referendum, still won't come clean about what they mean by Brexit, which is why they should come clean on the floor of the House of Commons. All right, Nick Clegg, thanks very much indeed for that. Now, Priti Patel was one of the dominant voices in the victorious Leave campaign, and although she was a sceptic about the aid department, DFID, she now finds herself running it, and she is also on Theresa May's key Brexit Cabinet Committee, an influential voice as the Prime Minister charts Britain's course out of the European Union. So, we just heard Priti Patel from, from Nick Clegg saying there that there should be a vote in, on the floor of the House of Commons about the terms of the Brexit vote, and making the strong point that Parliament is supposed to be sovereign in this country. Well, good morning, Andrew. Good morning. I think the Prime Minister could not have been any clearer when it comes to Parliament and the discussions and the debates that will be forthcoming in the House of Commons. She's so not going to allow a vote. Already what we have seen, we're seeing debates and questions in the House of Commons nearly every single day right now. But also there'll be a very full discussion when we have the Great Repeal Bill, which of course will be about repealing the European Communities Act from 1972. And that will go through rightfully the parliamentary process and give plenty of parliamentarians enough time and the right kind of time to discuss the actual repeal of that bill. People like Nick Clegg would say that the Great Repeal Bill comes too late in the process, that we need before that, before Article 50 is triggered, a proper discussion on the floor of the House of Commons about what kind of relationship we want with the EU after we leave it. Well, I think, Andrew, on that point in particular, we're having that debate right now. You know, we've had statements and debates in the House of Commons, I think, twice this week alone. So that debate and discussion is happening. The point about the Great Repeal Bill is that it is a milestone. It is the first significant milestone in 
in terms of repealing legislation and absolutely yes having the parliamentary conventions the discussions and the debates but also focusing on on aspects of EU law that simply do not work for Britain sure. and we have to do that so that we can get the right kind of deal that works in our national interests. It's a very important bill but it's, it comes later in the process in a sense. Um, so what is your message to Nick Clegg and those people who say in the end we ought to have a vote on the floor of the House of Commons about our new relationship with the EU before we start negotiations, before it's too late? Well, I'd say respectfully that the job of the government is to deliver the result of the referendum. The Prime Minister has said a number of times Brexit means Brexit. We've seen the largest vote in this country this year through the EU referendum. The British people have spoken and we're going to deliver for them. This is not about using Parliament as a vehicle to subvert the democratic will of the British public. Debates are happening. There will be a very significant debate, several debates I suspect, around the Great Repeal Bill. We have new committees, a select committee in the House of Commons. We have a new Secretary of State in David Davis and his new government department. They are in and out of the Commons on a near daily basis. So yes, these are debates taking place right now. But importantly, we as government are focused on delivering Brexit and delivering that important vote that the British public voted on this June. Now, you talked about using Parliament. In fact, Parliament is the sovereign body. Let me read you something that one of your colleagues, the Conservative MP Stephen Phillips, said today. And he, is, he, he voted for Brexit, I think. I and many others did not, ex he said he did, did not exercise our vote on the referendum so as to restore the sovereignty of this Parliament, only to see what we regarded as the tyranny of the European Union, replaced by that of a government that apparently wishes to ignore the views of the House on the most important issue facing the nation. Well, there's no ignoring any views whatsoever of the House and my colleagues in Parliament. This is the point that I'm making. But if you I don't have it. a vote, it's, it's, it's just talk. But there will be votes on the Great Repeal Bill. And, of course, Much later there, in the process. There, there are discussions taking place, Andrew, every day in the Commons right now, as I've highlighted. And, obviously, my colleague David Davis is assiduous at answering questions in the House of Commons. He's been doing that on a near daily basis. And rightly mm. so. You know, he is being held to account by the House of Commons and Parliament as well. But I think I think the other point that I would like to make, and this is a much broader point about the, the negotiations, we're not going to come on every single day and give a running commentary. If I were to sit down and play poker with you this morning, I'm not going to show you my well, cards before poker, we but, uh, even, even start yeah. playing the game. All right. Um, just just one, one more on this. However, um, the Commons is going to have a series of votes. But these MPs are determined to have an early vote. And in the end, as a cabinet minister, you can't stop that happening. What happens to the government if there's a vote on Article 50 and our attitude to Article 50 and the government loses? Well, look, what happens then? We look, we, take, we look at everything that happens in Parliament and obviously the debates that are taking place now and the debates that people are alluding to as well. We will work with all colleagues and I think the point to make here is that this isn't about a them or us mentality whatsoever. We are listening to colleagues respectfully as we've had the debate mm -hmm. this week. There's been one debate, there's been a statement in the House of Commons, there's select committee discussions taking place as well. We will work with all colleagues and the point is though, we're clear, we have to deliver for the British public okay. and we will do that in the right way government has set up the mechanisms we have two government departments we have cabinet committees sure. we have colleagues working together and we will continue to do that in terms of the substance what you will deliver can we clear one thing up that it is not possible for us to stay inside a tariff-free single market well look I'm not going to as I've already well, indicated no, but, but you, you said know, I'm not going to be specific about this because this is a, this not? is a long-standing negotiation we are negotiating how we are going to reform our relationship with the European Union. The Prime Minister is leading that, and rightly so. Okay. But actually, you, Andrew, you we should talk about... You said during the campaign that we'd be outside the single market. So did Michael Gove. Nobody can see any way that we can stay inside a single market if we are genuinely going to keep take back control over immigration. That's impossible. Everybody around Europe says it's impossible. Why can the government not acknowledge what is obvious? Well, actually, I think we look at this from a slightly different perspective. We are now looking at the new opportunities that leaving the European Union will bring. And that means it's new trade and opportunities. Entirely different question. New, but also new opportunities in terms of taking back control of immigration as well, in the way in which the British public have asked us to, the vote that took place in June and we have okay. to be open-minded we're looking at all options and rightly so that is the job of the government to look at all options as we enter the negotiation the Prime Minister is heading off to India for her first big overseas trade visit very shortly you said during the campaign I know it's Bangladesh not India that um, 
it would be very good news for curry houses. We'd get more curry chefs if we left the EU because we could adjust our immigration uh, accordingly. But if we're going to get down to tens of thousands, and if non-EU immigration is now 190,000, then you're going to have to have very severe measures to cut back non-EU immigration, including from India. Well, the point is, is that we've, I was clear during the referendum campaign, I spoke about this myself. The objective was to take back control of our immigration controls, importantly, that's what the British public want. But also, we want to continue to attract the brightest and the best in the right way. And yes, there are sensitivities. People have concerns and anxieties about EU immigration and the fact, because of free movement, we've not been in control of our policies. Now, the point about, you know, immigration outside of the European Union, of course, we'll look at all options to support the brightest and the best. We are an open economy. We want to make sure that we have those that have the talents to sustain our economy, grow our economy, continues. So and I how think are you the going point, to cut the numbers? Well, the point about the Prime Minister's visit as well is about, you know, building on those links between new countries and new trade and opportunities. But in terms of reducing numbers, the Home Secretary and obviously alongside the Cabinet will develop an immigration policy that works for Britain and is not subject to what we've seen with free movement mm. and the fact that we've not been able to control our immigration okay. because of our membership with the European Union. You were very uh, vociferous in your criticism of the department that you now lead before you led it. Um, you, were, you were pretty critical about our attitude to overseas aid. You're announcing today a lot of aid for Haiti. First of all, what is that about? And secondly, are you going native? Well, Already. well, first of all, Andrew, our aid plays a crucial role in terms of Britain's stand and Britain's place in the world. And I've been unequivocal in terms of our commitment to the 0.7% as well of our aid budget. Um, and spending you're, not gonna, that. you're not going to underspend but that? Absolutely not. But I think it's important when you look at you know, the state of the world right now, Haiti is a very good example. We are spending over £7 million in Haiti. Mm. Haiti is a catastrophe. It is a human disaster. Um, I've just announced an additional £3 million to go to support the people of Haiti. There is a cholera epidemic that's taking place there right now. We're sending in food, shelter kits, water purification units and things of that nature. But also, I think importantly when it comes to aid, we need to be much more coordinated. We need to spend our aid better, um, much more strategically, following the money, following people and outcomes. And I'll make no apologies to anyone when it comes to actually targeting the money so that it serves our national interests, absolutely, but also serves the poorest in the world. We want better outcomes for the poorest in the world who, quite frankly, don't have the same opportunities and the access to the opportunities really? that we yes. do. And also through developing new trading relationships as well. You know, these will be many countries so that are the poor countries. We're going countries. to see a different kind of, of DFID policy under pretty Patel. Well, I will focus on prosperity, jobs, livelihoods and economic development. These are the things that right. take people out of poverty but also ensure that we have trading relationships for the future okay. as well. Pretty Patel, thank you very much indeed for joining us. I've been getting away with it all